it's um, a great pleasure for me to be having this fireside chat uh, with Josh uh, Billinker, who's the founding uh, president and CEO of Lux Oncology, which was uh, recently acquired by Eli Lilly. Uh, Josh's unique blend of expertise um, um, is uh, pretty special, uh, and it includes the regulatory experience as a former medical officer at the FDA, uh, and a successful track record as a partner at uh, Iceland Capital. Uh, and that has uh, essentially placed them uh, among the most effective leaders in industry today. Uh, so Josh, it's great to be reconnecting with you and uh, thanks for joining the discussion today. Thanks. So uh, Josh, my first question is about uh, Josh Billinker. Uh, can you please tell us a little about uh, uh, his journey uh, as a University of Pennsylvania trained oncologist who went from federal service uh, to investing and then subsequently to uh, launching one of the most innovative and efficient biotech companies in recent years. Uh, well, okay. Um, <laughs> first thing about Josh Belanker, never refers to himself in the third person. So uh, here, here's a little bit about me. Um, I, I was an aspiring drug developer in my last year of fellowship and I came to the recognition that I was never going to be a great academic drug developer for reasons that I won't uh, go on and on about. And uh, I went to the FDA to work in order to understand the sort of final, the final drive to the goal line of drug development. It felt like that was a black box that uh, both PIs and, and other constituents just never really understood. And I thought, how interesting would it be to see how that really worked? I'm married to an attorney. and very common for attorneys to work at the SEC or the Department of Justice or um, elsewhere in the government to understand, you know, how certainly regulated industries really work. Um, and so I landed at FDA in the middle 2000s um, at a time when the Office of Oncology hadn't yet been formed. It, it, it took form as I, it, in the middle of the two years I was there. And um, it was a great place to get a lot of responsibility quickly, to learn on the ground, to understand how sponsors approach things. Um, and, um, you know, at the time, um, you know, from a career trajectory standpoint, I, I had trouble um, seeing how, um, you know, there was a many, many, many year arc, I, I thought at the time, between me and sort of um, some of the, the the more senior leadership positions uh, in the in the office structure then, and I think that's largely changed now. And I, I think it's a much more entrepreneurial culture than it was. Anyway, I, I started looking outside the walls for for other uh, opportunities, and I thought working as a venture investor would be a nice way to um, sort of have the fun of a, of an energetic startup with without committing to a single drug success. In other words, diversification across many companies by exposure. And then it was doing that for seven, eight years and living through the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, among other, many other things that I realized I was sort of more far removed from the, the drug development moment than I that had expected or hoped. And I had a chance to start a company. And I did that from my desk uh, at a, in a New York City high rise. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about the drugs that, that ensued from there. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, uh, so before we uh, go into the specifics, um, you know, the, the idea of precision medicine you know, is something that people have been talking about for a long time, um, and typically it's defined as giving the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. Uh, so what does precision oncology uh, mean to you in the context of a biomarker-driven approach to therapeutic development? Um. I, I think you said it in the last few words of this, the question, which is, it, to me, it's an incredibly diagnostic-driven conceptualization. It's a molecular diagnosis. It's, it's, I think, in modern parlance, the use of tumor genomic profiling at scale to identify populations of patients who otherwise would likely not have ever been found, who there, who then can be paired and matched with a unique uh, single or hopefully cocktail of, of appropriate drugs. Um, that makes sense. So, so um, um, uh, the way that we're diagnosing disease is evolving, and this came up during your last panel discussion. Um, and it's, it's very interesting when one thinks about that, you know, how we've gone from classification of disease based on anatomy, where the tumor is, 
uh, to histology to now molecular profiling, where instead of uh, the location of a lesion, we're looking at the underlying mechanism of disease. Uh, obviously, uh, Lux Oncology's uh, 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 uh spoke to those uh, ethos and, and, and that strategy, and it was FDA's second tissue agnostic uh, approval. Um, so do you think, Josh, that the next generation of opportunities in oncology um, need to think about uh, pursuing a tissue agnostic approach um, rather than um, pegging everything to conventional ways of disease classification on oncology and the associated diagnostic modalities and uh, put more of our resources uh, into understanding the underlying mechanism of disease and pairing uh, our therapies uh, to the mechanism of disease rather than histological classification uh, or anatomic location of, of tumors. I think it's uh, just another tool in the drug development um, toolbox. Um, and what I mean is that um, it's, it's an incredibly sexy idea, it's an incredibly current idea, uh, but it's not right for, certainly not right for every program. It's certainly not the easiest path to prosecute for most programs. Uh, in the case of the Entrac fusion story uh, and the, the, the approval of Vitracvi, it was really a, a, a development plan born out of necessity. And, and that necessity was the extreme rarity of the underlying biomarker. And um, it was, uh, there was, there was really no credible way we thought there, there were there were 20 disease types that all harbored at some small subset level uh, an N-track gene fusion that appeared to be activating an oncogenic in a context independent way, and so given the rarity, uh, it was necessary to amalgamate to bring together the, the 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 20 disease types and not get hung up on the sort of threshold statistics for each silo by histology and instead use a biologic first principle and to say, well, I'm looking at the same genomic alteration. Um, I seem to have point estimates which suggest that there's equal activity in a context independent way. In other words, we don't have the BRAF melanoma, be the BRAF colorectal exception, which everybody sort of points to. Mm -hmm. We don't seem to have that. And so how do we get critical mass of sample size? Uh, and the, the way to get critical mass of sample size to rule out a lower bound of clinically relevant efficacy was to bring together all these different histologies. And uh, also, it was an age agnostic approval. There was simultaneously approval in pediatric and adult patients. So that was another co trick that was used to sort of gross up the sample size to, again, identify a clinically meaningful effect size. So it, it was born out of necessity, and it was born out of the diversity of the underlying um, tumor set, and it was born out of the extreme rarity in any given tumor, tumor type. Um, I'm sure, but, um, you know, it, it took a lot of insight, I'm sure, to recognize the necessity uh, of it all. Because at the time, you know, when you launched Lux Oncology, um, almost everyone else was focusing on immunotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so what was it that uh, allowed you to uh, see the path clearly and recognize uh, the necessity, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier? Well, there, there were a couple of interesting things in the moment that, that um, struck me. So it, right around the time, a, a, within a couple of years prior to founding LOXO in the sort of 2010 to 2013 period before LOXO existed, the ALK fusion story and the ROS1 fusion story in lung cancer had sort of unfolded, and that was a serendipitous finding of the sort of, um, as we all know now, the, the, you know, what is the EGFR wild type non-smoker phenotype? Like, why, why do these look like EGFR tumors, but they're not? Oh, well, there's these two other biomarkers at whatever we'd say now, 4% and 1% respectively are explaining those tumors. And that on, on nobody before that had thought that that kind of prevalence um, was developable. Um, those were proof of concept uh, programs in that they, they, they took the bar lower and lower in terms of the underlying prevalence of the biomarker at hand. And I think between those three success stories in lung cancer, EGFR, ALK, and ROS, 
there was a rationale for like mass testing in lung cancer um, that began to unlock the long tail of less prevalent events. And then there was a uh, Bob Doble's lab out of the University of Colorado. They, they published a study in Nature Genetics, a case series on the foundation medicine platform where they identified, I believe, three NTRAC gene fusion events in lung cancer patients who were pan negative, pan wild type for the canonical now EGFR ALK and ROS. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, here's yet another um, perhaps ROS1 type of development program. And so I thought when I committed to developing um, the track fee and filed the IND, I thought it was going to become a lung cancer development program. And I thought it was going to be feasible because the lung cancer community had somehow already committed to the idea of testing genomically. And what I learned after about a year of enrolling no lung cancer patients was that, well, the underlying rarity in lung cancer was likely much higher than um, or more extreme than, than the ROS1 rarity, which was already pretty low at 1%. So um, that just forced uh, sort of a, a doubling down. And we got a bit lucky that um, the, the team at Foundation Medicine referred us a, a, a handful of patients. They, they sort of responded uniformly. The first patient was a sarcoma patient, um, had an amazing deep response after um, exhausting uh, you know, conventional therapies. So um, with, with, there was this flywheel of excitement that, that unfolded that to say, well, hey, maybe there's this pan marker that's rare in any given case, but sums to a, a, a clinically meaningful group of patients. Um, so we sort of pivoted from a lung mindset to a pan tumor mindset, and we were just hoping at that point that um, our colleagues at FDA would, um, would sort of see it the same way, and fortunately, they did. Sure. And so, in terms of um, um, you know looking at what Foundation Medicine had in their data assets, uh, uh, did you have access to other registries to test out the hypothesis for a pan tumor approach? Uh, access is a very strong word. Um, no, is, I guess we had. I think the the operational challenge that. LOXO took on in its early days and did its best to, to excel at was just your question. How do, how, do we, how do we create the right set of relationships and alignments to find patients? And so I, I think there were two big sources of patients. One was um, the commercial central lab testing models of um, companies like Foundation and, and Keras and, and others. But the foundation was, was ahead, sort of, uh, certainly in its testing volumes. Um, and then the sort of highly motivated um, tertiary care center sites like Memorial Sloan Kettering that were using tumor genomic profiling as a loss leader as part of their academic mission or, or you know, by philanthropy support. And we're, we're characterizing every patient who was being seen at the institution. And there, are only, there aren't still today that many centers that embrace that mm -hmm. approach. But um, identifying, so this is not a CRO-driven trial. This is a hand-to-hand -hand combat fight. Because you think about the alignment you need. You need a molecular lab that's stood up the right tumor panel, that has the right probe sets to cover a gene fusion. In the case of NTRAC, that was not a trivial problem. I mean, gene fusions, while I'd argue some of the most actionable events in oncology, are actually very difficult to find genomically unless you really try proactively. They, um, they take up a lot of sequencing bandwidth on DNA-based methods, and they're still not well tracked on blood-based methods, um, to um, liquid biopsy methods. So um, you have to, so there's a chicken and egg problem. You know, there's no reason for a platform to contain this, uh, this difficult probe set if there's no drug, and there'll never be a drug if, if the, the panels don't include it. So there's this, you just sort of have to work with the serendipity at, that you're given to then generate exciting case series data that hopefully becomes exciting phase one data that then becomes uh, more. And um, that's, th there's a proselytization that needs to happen. And um, so industry is not super well set up to, to pull this off, honestly. Um, uh, sure, it makes sense, um, uh, you know, in, in a way for, looking at precision oncology as K-1 
tailor treatments to patients who are more, most likely to benefit from the treatments, uh, we're probably looking at many, many small subsets of patients. And, um, and our subsets are going to get smaller and smaller if we continue to make advances in, in, in the same direction. Uh, and you're up absolutely right that the clinical trial enterprise and the way we uh, uh, conduct clinical trials, uh, the enterprise, whether it's uh, within uh, uh, one company uh, or um, uh, a CRO, uh, isn't really set up to accommodate these types of studies. Uh, however, these types of studies are exactly the types of studies we need uh, to bring tailored therapies to patients. Uh, because if we think about um, even in the old days of double chemotherapy in non sponsored lung cancer, the number needed to treat was about eight. So we treated eight patients for one patient to derive benefit. Right now, it's uh, with uh, small molecules um, and neutricone inhibitors in the setting of uh, biomarker positive patients, it's about two. That's amazing progress, but these are smaller subset of patients. Obviously, not every non sponsored lung cancer patient. Uh, benefits from uh, targeted uh, uh, therapies or would be eligible for, for targeted therapies. Uh, but number needed to treat of two is pretty impressive. It's amazing progress in the past uh, couple of decades. But another way to think about that is that still half of the patients are not benefiting even from the, uh, the targeted approach. Um, and, and so there are smaller subsets within the subsets that may have a single genomic uh, driving mutation. So do you think the answer to that um, is uh, to look for um, multimodal biomarkers and complex biomarkers uh, to tease out patients uh, that still may not benefit uh, maximally from um, a single biomarker-driven approach? Is that practical? You're referring to the, you're referring to the one out of two non-responders, or are you referring to the, the, the group that we have nothing for today? Well, yeah. Uh, well, let's say the uh, patients that we typically say they have primary resistance. They just, you know, they have the biomarker, uh, but they just don't respond to, to the therapy. So they, they're probably other mechanisms. And, and, um, and the idea of some people are advocating for a more complex uh, phenotyping strategy. Um, and you know, in the more living checkpoint inhibitor, obviously we start with PDL1 and uh, microcyte uh, instability, and now there's tumor mutational burden. So it's already becoming, in a way, a complex phenotype. Uh, so is that the direction that we should pursue, in your opinion? If you believe the literature that you know, say 10 to 20 percent of human cancers are these sort of simple, dumb ones of single gene driven. Um, and, you know, the, the aspersion of response rates for those, whether, you know, I, I think it's a, a function of the underlying drug and, you know, sort of average inhibitors that achieve IC50s get 40 or 50 percent ORRs and the IC95 drugs get 75 percent ORRs with another probably 10 to 20 percent missing resist cutoff, but clearly showing biologic dependence and probably deriving some benefit, even though we don't measure it very well in a strict regulatory sense. Um, I, I don't think we have a, a, a big problem there. And I, I always find it funny that, that I have to answer for that question when I'm the guy with the 90% ORRs functionally. Um, like, where, where, is the, where is the debate in the PD-1 panel? Uh, why, why aren't we talking about the 10% who get durable disease control on PD-1 inhibitors when 100% of them are re receiving the therapy? So like, um, I find it funny that I have to account for it. But, um, I do care about the question of both primary and secondary resistance, and and I don't. I, I think it's 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 a translational commitment to serial biopsy that is is ultimately the clue. Um, I, and I think we've done a lot of work to to look for on target and off target resistance, and on target being you know a binding mode problem, uh, a mutation that affects uh, relative potency. Uh, and then, of course, off-target is the you know alternative pathway up regulation that would invoke a combination. So, ironically, interestingly, with sometimes a commercially available targeted therapy with a pathway that we know how to drug. And then there's probably another third or 40 percent where we'll never know. We don't know, and mm -hmm. and that group is frustrating. And that group, you know, in a in a high quality phase one center, will have hopefully repeat serial biopsies that that teach us. 
the, the tumor biology at play. But um, I think we're doing a pretty good job there um, in, in the land of targeted therapy. And we could do even better if, um, again, these, these tumor genomic panel profiling was a more mainstream behavior. Mm -hmm. it just, it's still the, the rarefied um, technology of the, you know, the sort of, I don't know, leading 25 cancer centers. I mean, that's really where this is happening. I think, I think the community will refer out liquid biopsy because it's kind of easy. But liquid biopsy misses a lot of the ultrastructural like gene rearrangement stuff that mm -hmm. is highly actionable. And so, you know, I, 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 somehow we have to cross that chasm. And I, I have this sort of uh, pragmatic, fatalistic view that the, the only way it really happens is, isn't, isn't through conferences. It isn't through medical education. It's through better reimbursement. Uh, labs, right. labs need to be motivated and incentivized to run these tests more often and faster. Uh, make makes sense. Uh, so speaking of reimbursement um, and a closely related <clears throat> concept, uh, drug pricing. Um, so how do you think uh, those debates are going to evolve in, in the next five years? There's uh, clearly a lot of focus on drug pricing. Um, and what are some strategies that you think we can uh, employ in order to um, you know, have uh, uh, a uh, open and transparent uh, discussion about drug pricing, um, tying it to perhaps uh, outcomes. You know, uh, folks uh, typically uh, pricing in uh, um, for many pharma companies is is uh, typically a, a, a peri approval process kind of thought. You know, when you're uh, close to getting the approval, and uh, yes, in some cases even you know post approval. Uh, however, you know, there are folks that now are uh, talking about pre-contracting negotiations with third parties doing development. Uh, so what are your thoughts about that? And, and how can we be get a better handle on drug pricing? Well, um, I think I'm glad you didn't use the, the term financial toxicity uh, <laughs> right. because that, I think that's a deliberately sloppy term that, that conflates two separate problems. One problem is the out-of-pocket exposure of a sick patient to a non-discretionary choice, um, which is to save their own life by taking a drug. So why should they be penalized with inordinate out-of-pocket exposure to that drug, no matter what it's priced? And there's really no price for a drug that I think is fair or equitable to more than half the population that has virtually no savings or, uh, or long-term financial security. Um, so, and I think the second issue is the one you're you're asking about, which is drug pricing. And um, and so, are we willing as a clinical community to talk about how much a year of life is worth? Um, we used to be. Um, we we did it in the '80s uh, when you know hemodialysis needed to be covered by Medicare, no matter even under the age of 65. We used to talk about 55,000. You know, the in the in the British system, Nice talks about it in the quality adjusted life year framing. Um, and so we don't really, uh, you know, contractors who were sent to Iraq to work in a war zone were given a hazard pay bonus of 250K, implying, you know, a year of life to them was worth 250K. Um, and so how do we, like, what, what is, this is a collective conversation we all need to have. Um, and I don't see any of us really jump into that pool. Um, I think we're all we're all doing this head fake of like, well, it's all a reference based conversation, like like drug importation, uh, European pricing, um, you know, what, well, like somebody's setting a reference, uh, and, and can we have an an evolved conversation about what that should be? And um, I've said this before in other settings, but I think if you tell the community this is what we're willing to pay. I mean, drug development is a five to 10 year lead time endeavor. So, and it takes, you know, Bitrackvi, which addressed the very rare population, we spent, I believe, over $400 million getting it approved on a database of 55 patients. And we did it on a team of less than 100 people, largely. And I think we did it about as lean and as efficiently as possible. And it was still a $400 million process. We weren't spared any expense in terms of CMC. Uh, you know, standards in terms of data quality standards, in terms of uh, global regulatory and quality scrutiny. And so how, you know, the, 
the fixed costs of the equation aren't different for the small drug and the big drug. And I think um, the investor community looks at the, um, the unknown of a five to 10 years out problem and it says, well, you're asking me to put this money at risk with a go to zero probability because a lot of drugs fail. Like what is the risk reward of that bet you're asking me to make? And I think it's not good enough to do it at, in the Perry approval setting because the money's already sunk then. The capital's always been put at risk and that's not really fair. And, and, the, and the investor community will get wise to that and just not play the game. And I think that's already happened, by the way, in, in medical devices and diagnostics where funding really isn't happening nearly to the same degree because there's no price transparency um, at the time of investment risk. And so um, you asked me about the political debate we should have. Hopefully it's more nuanced, less coarse, and more um, compassionate than the one we have collectively about every other issue in our society. This, this one's really important. Like we've got we've to get this right. Um, there's no other modality in the healthcare system like drugs that can bend the curve from a, from a disease outcome standpoint. Um, and I mean, that's a, that's a, th there's really nothing out there like it. Um, you can't say that about durable medical equipment or end of life care or, you know, facilities and things like that. So um, sorry to ramble on about your, your great question. Sure, no, but, this uh, is uh, uh, the passion for it. Yeah. Sure, I mean, you're making great points. And, uh, uh, you know, I recently read uh, the uh, great uh, American Drug Deal uh, by Peter Kolchinsky, uh, who's uh, a founding partner at uh, RA Capital. He made a great point about uh, um, how much we pay as a society for branded drugs. And he made the argument that uh, sometimes we mistake paying uh, mortgage for paying rent. You know, rent is an expense. Uh, however, paying mortgage, you know, you build equity, it's, it's an investment. And paying for branded drugs is more like paying mortgage because you're building equity and, and these drugs ultimately go generic and, you know, the, um, the, the price drops. So um, I think uh, you're absolutely right um, that uh, in order for us to advance uh, and to be able to have those discussions, uh, we need to collectively have more open and transparent discussions. And patients obviously have to be uh, uh, involved uh, in these discussions because ultimately we want to reduce the uh, burden on the patient um, and um, you know out-of-pocket costs don't always correlate with uh, the price of the therapy uh, specifically uh, so no you weren't rambling and, and those are these are uh, very uh, important topics that uh, maybe uh, there'll be an op another opportunity in the future for us to dissect out those themes because they are critical in terms of how we think about drug development in the next five to ten years um, so I'm, we're almost out of time. I have one last question, uh, Josh, which has to do with what you mentioned earlier in terms of the challenges in patient recruitment and the types of trials that um, we need to set up uh, for uh, patients uh, with rare cancers. Uh, obviously, there are modalities and the things that we may be able to do with uh, rare cancer uh, registries, constructing external controls, but the idea of how we conduct clinical trials. Um, what are your thoughts about decentralization uh, of clinical trials um, as uh, a way of uh, reaching patients who do have you know, rare diseases and rare, rare cancers. Um, and because when we think about it, even in non-rare uh, diseases uh, uh, and in oncology, only about 3% of adult oncology patients have access to conventional clinical trials. Uh, so do you think decentralizing clinical trials um, and uh, using leveraging the technologies that we have available to us today for remote monitoring, remote data collection, um, is a practical way of uh, extending the reach of clinical investigations uh, to uh, greater groups of patients, including patients with rare cancers. I don't think it's practical yet. Um, for, for, for two reasons. The, the patients who live far away from the tertiary center um, are also likely ones who don't have access to genomic profiling. So they're sort of uh, both far away geographically and, and far away uh, scientifically, uh, and, and both are a problem. Uh, I think the second is, I mean, um, I'm being deliberately provocative uh, a little bit because I know that there's a lot of FDAers involved in this conference, but I haven't seen FDA really get comfortable with the more remote elements of data collection, are, are we going to? Is FDA going to be okay with 
the lack of central radiology review? Is the FDA going to be okay with fewer study visits going down from, say, weekly labs to every six to eight week labs? Is that going to be okay? Um, are they going to be okay with sort of maybe even less robust data quality collection because we're dealing with a less sophisticated um, investigator community that's not a professional trialist community? Like, I, I just don't, if the end goal is drug approval, which hopefully it is if you're running a study, I think it's hard to, it's hard to really get comfortable with the, with the trade-offs from a data quality perspective. I think the FDA is going to have to teach us how to do that and, teach, and convince us that they're really ready for us to be ready. Uh, Josh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining the discussion today. I think we could talk for another couple of hours, but uh, next time. Um, Thanks. So, Thanks uh, for having us. A lot of fun. Thank you, Josh. Uh, coming up next is uh, Dr. Andy uh, Crichton, uh, CEO of the Serum Roundtable on Cancer and Project Data Sphere. Mm -hmm.